Solar cells on small devices are nothing new. You only have to think back to your school math exams and the little PV cell on your calculator to realise this is the case. But what if we could extend this idea from small toys and calculators to mass market electronic devices like mice, keyboards and remote controls? Now this is exactly what Amazon backed spin-off Ambient Photonics have already started to implement with what it claims to be the world's most powerful low light energy harvesting cells. Through some clever innovation, they have been able to achieve the two criteria for market success, which as of yet had been pretty much mutually exclusive. These are high power density and low cost. Their breakthrough has produced cells which are up to three times more powerful than traditional silicon amorphous indoor cells, but with a performance akin to the far more expensive technologies found on satellite and research applications. So what exactly makes Ambient's technology so different from what's out there already? And how, in the future, could this be applied to everyday devices? Ambient uses a cell technology known as dye-sensitized solar cells, or DSSCs, which operate slightly differently to traditional silicon PV cells. They offer the particular advantage that they're less sensitive to low light situations or the angle of incidence of the light, which makes them better suited to indoor conditions. So how do they work? As opposed to silicon cells that use a PN junction, which I'll come on to a bit later, DSSCs operate using photosensitive dyes. Now the main difference here is that whilst in a PN junction the semiconductor both produces the charge carrier and transports it, in a DSSC the charge carrier comes from this photosensitive dye and then the semiconductor is only really there as a means of transporting it. The structure of a DSSC can be explained in relatively simple terms. Like in any sort of cell you have an anode, the positive electrode, and a cathode, the negative electrode. Let's take a look at the positive side first. You can see that immediately attached to the anode is our semiconductor, often something like titanium oxide. Notice the large gaps between the molecules? We want our semiconductor to have these gaps or be porous so that we can maximize the surface area available for our dye molecules that, as you can see here, are bonded directly to the semiconductor. If we head to the cathode now, we can see that it is only in contact with an iodide electrolyte. Now if we sandwich these two parts together, we have made our DSSC. What happens if we shine some light on it then? First our dye molecules absorb a photon of light, causing electrons to be excited. The dye then injects this electron into the conduction band of the semiconductor. In other words, the electron has enough energy to move freely through it. It can then be collected at the anode and passed through an external circuit, generating electricity. Now if you remember, our dye molecule has lost its electron, so this needs to be regenerated in some way to complete the cycle. This is done by the iodide electrolyte, which donates an electron to the dye molecule, forming triiodide. And then finally, at the cathodes, the triiodide ions accept electrons again, restoring them to iodide ions. Now I won't go into the same level of detail for how a PN junction solar cell works, but the principle is that you have two layers of silicon, an N-type containing excess electrons and a P-type layer containing holes where electrons once were. Now when a photon is absorbed by the P-side, excited electrons are swept to the N-side, causing opposing charge to build up. If we connect these two layers then, the excess electrons on the N-side will flow through an external circuit to the P-side, where they will recombine with the holes. This doesn't always happen though. Sometimes an electron can recombine with its own hole before it has a chance to transfer to the N-side. And so, particularly in low light conditions where electron mobility is low, recombination becomes a big issue, dramatically reducing the ability for the cell to operate. In DSSCs, however, because we've separated the charge carrier production by the photosensitive dye and the charge carrier transportation by the semiconductor, recombination is much less of an issue, and so they operate far better in lower light conditions. But DSSCs offer other advantages as well. Another problem we have with conventional PV cells is silicon. Silicon is an expensive material to process. For most PV cells, purifying and crystallizing the silicon is the most expensive and most energy intensive part of the production process. DSSCs, however, can be made relatively cheap, 
with relatively low energy use and produced using more sustainable materials. But what makes Ambience technology in particular so game-changing in this space? Well, it all comes down to the dye. Ambient have created 40 in-house molecules that can be combined into mixtures that offer superior absorption capabilities. The advantage of these dye-based solar cells is that you can mix up the dye with different molecules to tune the properties for certain applications. This means that ambient cells can work just as effectively in lead-lit environments to those lit by halogen bulbs, a trait not many PV technologies can match. Now just to bore you with some stats, ambient cells have light harvesting efficiencies between 3 to 5 times greater than conventional ruthenium dyes, and they have photon conversion efficiencies of over 90% in low light scenarios. The graph pictured here shows that even at the lowest light intensities, ambient cells deliver an open circuit voltage that is significantly higher than your average DSSC. Now, unlike older technologies which often need to string their solar cells together in series to boost the voltage, ambient cells produce enough on their own to facilitate a monolithic architecture using single cells. And so, by being able to remove grid lines between cells, this is a technology that has big aesthetic advantages. If you look at some of the technologies where ambient photovoltaics have been applied, you would hardly notice the solar cell unless you knew it was there. Now another attractive feature of these cells is their customizability. They can be produced using industrial printing processes which allow for cells to be created of any shape or size for any kind of application. Their increased power allows cells to be made smaller too, and so they are easy to integrate into most product designs. Recently, Ambient have unveiled a bifacial cell that would allow energy to be harvested from both sides of a device simultaneously. Think for example a TV remote that can be placed on either side. So could this technology really see the end of battery powered home devices? The average consumer in the US disposes of 8 batteries every year on average, and recycling rates for alkaline batteries remain low across the globe. By not only producing renewable energy for home devices, but also simultaneously eliminating the battery problem, these cells could provide a major step forward in terms of reaching sustainable goals. But are they really realistic? Let me know what you think in the comments. As always, I'm Luke, and this was The Upshift.